Hello everyone, welcome back to the latest session. In the last uh, two sessions, we looked at how much water to uh, what do we say uh, design for uh, and uh, then we looked at the kind of quality of water that we want to achieve, right. So, obviously now we are going to look at how to achieve the quality of water that we want to achieve. Let us uh, move on. So, water treatment. So, plant requirement in general, ideal case, uh, depending on how well you design it and the capital cost, you want to design such that even when one of your unit process, uh, let us say sedimentation tank, one is out of service, the other said there should be another standby sedimentation tank to be able to, uh, you know, cater to the needs of the population. So, that is what we have here. So, able to, ability to handle design flow the design flow with one unit out of service. So, typical water treatment plant uh, layout, let us look at this. So, here we are concerned about removal of turbidity and color from surface water. Why is this important? As I mentioned, uh, depending on the kind of uh, water intake, you know, water treatment process will change. For example, if it is groundwater, you know, the aquifer, uh, groundwater subsurface aquifer or ground uh, aquifer, groundwater aquifer will act as a filter, right. So, thus turbidity will be relatively less in groundwater in general, unless it has uh, great levels of uh, what do we say uh, influence due to surface water or such, but rarely that will be the case. So, then I will choose a different mechanism. Why? Because groundwater typically higher hardness, I will need to look at removal of hardness and such. But if it is surface water, typically turbidity will be high, turbidity in the sense suspended uh, particulate matter or such will be high. So, I need to look at that. So, in that context, I would like to mention again River Yamuna, right. Uh, we have plants or water treatment plants, huge water treatment plants, 150 million gallons per day or such, I believe. One gallon is equal to 2.3 or 2.7 liters. So, you have these huge plants in Mathura and Agra. So, one built earlier uh, is based on the traditional technique and we will look at that I guess later or rather I want to mention that later and the other one they are using a wastewater treatment uh, process based uh, system to be able to treat this uh, surface water. Why is that? Because river Yamuna you know depending on when you sample you are going to have BOD to be this and uh, maybe COD to be 70, 80 milligram per liter COD, right. And here the issue is if you look at the dissolved organic carbon, it will be around what 8 to 9 to 12 milligram per liter, milligram per liter dissolved organic carbon. So, it is almost, not almost, it is uh, under the category of sewage, let us say. So, that is why they were using uh, MBBR moving bed biofilm reactor based plant to treat the uh, water and then supply it for drinking water. So, that is the kind of uh, process or uh, different kinds of unique process that people have to employ based on the kind of water that they take. But that is a unique case river Yamuna though it caters to a large population. Uh, typically, we have uh, what do we say uh, uh, other uh, what do we say rivers too. And we are not going to have those rivers being as polluted as Yamuna, but that is something that I wanted to mention. MBBR, I think you remember I showed a media in one of the previous uh, sessions and uh, that media will act as a surface for the microbes to grow on, that those microbes will degrade my organic content which will lead to this high BOD. Okay, enough of that. Let us come back to this. In this case, I am just concerned about surface water which has relatively high turbidity, right. So, what is it that I want to do? Let us go through stepwise. So, surface water is coming in from stream, river or lake. Screens, right? You are always going to have screens because you will always have different kinds of stuff thrown into the water and you can have a coagulant added. Yes, we will look at why a coagulant is required. We will look at that later. For mixing it well and for coalescing the particles and so, in, so that the initial coalition starts, you are going to have rapid mixing and then you will have a flocculation basin where you want to form the flocks. So, here the turbulence and thus the mixing intensity will be less. Once the bigger flocks are formed, you will have a sedimentation basin where we use 
gravity, let's say, our friend to be able to remove these bigger particles or bigger suspended particles or the flocks from the water, right? And obviously, here we are decreasing the turbidity. Those particles that are too small to be settled out, what do we want to do? We want to form flocks. To form flocks, we want to see to it that the particles come together. But typically, you know, they need to overcome their electro, what do we say, force of repulsion. So, for that, we add uh, coagulant. We will look at the relevant reasons uh, later. And then, after that is done, the flocks can be formed, right? And once the bigger flocks are formed, they will be removed in the sedimentation tank, let us say, right? And after that, even then, you will have some particles which will still be suspended but might take too long to be removed in a sedimentation tank. So, you will have a sand filter. And in sand filter itself, you will have quite a few pathogens that can be removed, let us say, right? And obviously, the last step is always disinfection. You want to kill the pathogens that are left, and that is why you add pathogens. Uh, not pathogens, pardon me, you won't add pathogens. You are going to disinfect the water by adding a disinfecting agent which is typically an oxidizing compound or UV, right? Why UV? It will damage the DNA or the RNA of the pathogens. And then we are also going to ensure residual chlorine levels or residual disinfection levels so that in the distribution system, you have chlorine that can tackle or take care of any uh, microbial uh, growth or re-entry into the distribution network. And what else? So, from time to time, obviously, these filters will be choked. So, you want to have to backwash it back wash. So, if in, during the screen solids are what do we say formed, you have to dispose them and sedimentation basin, the sludge that comes down, right, you are going to have to dispose it typically inert if it is surface water. So, this is the case. What is it we are doing here? In all this process, we are forming bigger particles, flocks, right, and then we are removing them from the water by letting them settle down. Here, we are filtration right, rapid sand filter, again suspended particle, right, and then we are killing the pathogens. So, in effect, here we are removing the turbidity and here we are dealing with the pathogens, right. So, that is what we have, but if it was ground water which has hardness, hardness is due to calcium and magnesium, we will look at this again later, but just an introduction to help understand the issues. So, this will affect, I will get pictures later at least. If this is my pipe, you know, almost this section will be scaled up. For example, you would have seen this earlier, uh, at least when you we used to boil water for, I guess, uh, hot water to have a hot water bath or to drink, right? Uh, one sure way of disinfection is boiling the water. To drink, we used to see that over time this vessel had uh, what do we say scale being formed, and over time I had to supply energy at a greater intensity or heat the water for a longer time to be able to achieve the same level of uh, what do we say final temperature. So, obviously, my heating efficiency is decreasing there. And you know, why is this due to? It is because you know, precipitates of calcium and uh, magnesium precipitation earlier they were dissolved, dissolved in the relevant uh, solution. When I heated it, you know, some of it, uh, some forms will precipitate out, right. So, again, uh, we have permanent and temporary hardness and so on based on how they can be removed, but we will look at that later. And what else other than this precipitation? Calcium and magnesium, they will affect the ability or the amount of soap I require to be able to clean myself, the utensils or the clothes, let us say. So, that is again one other aspect, it will stain all your bathroom, uh, what do we say, wear like pipes and such and they will break. So, these are aspects that need to be uh, considered, thus we need to remove or uh, look at removal of hardness. So, ground water from wells, so we can add different chemicals like lime or soda ash, lime CaOH twice, soda ash Na2CO3. So, here we are adding lime to increase the pH here to add CO3 2 minus so that you can precipitate the compounds in the form of calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate and such. We will look at that later, right? And then we are mixing that pretty fast, rapid mixing. And then we have the reaction basin here, right? And then the settling tank, we are letting that settle down and the sludge will be taken out, obviously, settling down. 
and because the pH will is being increased you want to decrease the pH. How do you decrease the pH? By adding carbon dioxide. So, I think in this aspect I will need to look at the or again briefly talk about acid base uh, chemistry because that plays a role and then it will be easier to understand the relevant aspects rather than looking at it in uh, what we see pieces. For example, carbon dioxide is a gas when I dissolve it into water right some of it will dissolve in water but it won't stay as CO2 it will stay as H2CO3 right H2CO3 obviously has this two protons H plus so it can donate that it can donate H2CO3 so H2CO3 will be in equilibrium with HCO3 minus and CO3 2 minus right and in each process it can give out one H plus. If you see the, you know we are having acid dissociating. So, this is the acid and this is the most deprotonated form. For example, earlier too we looked at this HOCl being, e being in equilibrium with OCl minus. So, this ratio of HOCl to OCl will depend upon the pH and pKa of the solution. We looked at that earlier, but we will come back to that. Why is that relevant? Because CO3 2 minus will you know precipitate out some of the calcium and the magnesium that is why you need to add CO3 2 minus at least that is what we are adding here. And here we are adding CO2 to bring the pH down because during this step we increase the pH a lot high pH water we cannot drink. So, we are going to add carbonate to also increase the alkinity and decrease the pH right that is what we have. And then again rapid sand filter finally disinfection storage and distribution right. So, different ways to go about it. So, when you say you are drinking water treat it, how are you going to treat it? It is going to obviously depend upon the kind of water that is being treated. So, unit operations different operations that we are going to look at in this particular class or during the other half of this course. So, preliminary treatment we will not discuss much, but in general it is screens right. And what else? At least in Agra and Mathura, what do they do? If they uh, directly have these sedimentation tanks and such, microbes grow all along the side walls or there is microbial growth. Why? Because there is a lot of organic content, wherever there is organic content, the microbes will thrive. So, sometimes they pre chlorinate the water. So, that is one kind of preliminary treatment, let us see. Another case is when you have high iron content in your water, let us see right Fe2 plus or manganese or such. So, you want to precipitate that out. How do you do that? Iron in the form of Fe2 plus is very soluble meaning it wants to stay in water, but if you oxidize it to Fe3 plus right. So, how will it go plus electron right or go, if you see to it that the electron is removed then Fe3 plus will typically precipitate out as Fe OH thrice the solid pretty easily. But how do I do this? To do this, I need to accept this electron. So, what is a common electron acceptor? You know, oxygen is a common electron acceptor. Let's see. anyway, we don't, we are not going to balance it now. So that's how you can uh, go ahead and do that. As in, you are going to aerate the water so that iron is oxidized to Fe3 plus and precipitates out. So these are some of the preliminary treatment steps that are used. But we'll look at that later. But we are typically concerned with turbidity or suspended particles. And relatively heavier particles they would uh, what do we say uh, come out right, but there are some that will not yes. So, how do I take care of this? So, what do I need to do? Uh, I need to first understand why are these particles not coming together by themselves right. If there are different particles why do not they come together by themselves and make my job easier. First we will understand why and then we will see how we can you know start this what do we say issue of coagulation right when we destabilize the solution right now solution is stable as in the particles do not want to come together and settle out they are very stable. So, coagulation I am adding coagulants to destabilize the system so that the initial coalescence can take place let us see initially the particles can start coalescing or I want to be able to neutralize the charge on the collides again we will see why and then after this we want to promote formation of bigger flocks bigger flocks. Flocks we also came across in that uh, wastewater secondary treatment after biological treatment the kind of microbes we want to form you know they will settle down right. So, that is something we looked at. So, over the uh, next two or three lectures we will be looking at coagulation and flocculation. Then we will look at uh, softening of hard water, 
hard water meaning the one that has calcium and magnesium. Sedimentation we looked at it earlier, but maybe now we will look at the design aspects. Filtration, different types of filtration, ion exchange relatively recent one and disinfection I guess I should have also had RO and uh, what do we see under nano filtration we will look at under filtration we will look at nano or ultra filtration right. So, these aspects we will look at. So, let us move on and look at the aspect at hand which is coagulation and then flocculation. So, first ok application for removal where is it coming into the picture let us see right. So, I have microorganisms that are suspended on the relevant uh, or in the relevant water. I have turbidity due to relevant uh, particles that are out there. The toxic compounds that are adsorbed onto these particles and NOM. So, water let us say I have a river water and if there is a thriving uh, system aquatic system or ecosystem or let us say there is a rain and it comes in contact with the dead leaves and plants and you know the uh, they leach organic matter organic matter right cells and that comes into the river. So, all this builds up and you have natural or otherwise you will have a lot of organic matter and these are again as you know precursors to DBP. So, I want to be able to remove these I guess right and how do I go about that or uh, such. So, the first aspect is what is the what are the characteristics of the particles that I want to remove as in why is it that they do not come together by themselves right. It is ok I guess I skipped it a bit. First is why cannot I remove them easily because the size is too small as you can see 0 0.01 to 1 right. Some bacteria and certainly viruses are in this particular zone uh, they would not settle in your lifetime even these suspended particles which are relatively heavier now you can see from which range they are visible to the eye as you see all this they are not visible to the eye right or most of it here anyway is not very much visible to the eye they to take their own time. So, you want to fasten the rate at which they settle down right to do that there are different ways one is filtration conventional filtration by granular media you can see that I can capture some bacteria and such, but viruses obviously are not going to be captured they are much smaller. So, they will be removed during ultra filtration or nano filtration, but again that is a different aspect. So, here I am concerned about these suspended particles right and if I want to just use conventional filtration where the size of the pores is relatively bigger or just sedimentation to remove these particles what do I need to do. I need to see to it that bigger particles are formed from the smaller particles, but they would not come together why is that because they have a net negative charge. So, why do they have a net negative charge let us see that they have a net you know let us say this is my suspended colloid and it has a net negative charge right. So, this negative, negative charge will prevent these two particles from coming towards each other right like like they repel right there is electric electrostatic repulsion. So, there is a predominant negative surface charge what is that due to for example, ionization again it is acid base or based on the pH right. So, based on the pH you know HOCl can predominate or OCl can predominate OCl minus can predominate this has no charge this has charge. So, you know it is here these are dissolved compounds, but I am just using that in as an example for example, you have silica. Silica, silica has hydroxyl groups on its surface right here we are talking about SI 4 plus sand silica right and depending on the pH you know the pH here we have we talked about the pKa and pH right depending in the acid base context. So, this is the case and this is pKa pKa this is the HOCl this is the OCl minus if pH is low most of the acid is present as HOCl and very uh, less is present as OCl minus which has a charge. So, similarly here we are not talking about acids and bases, but still you have uh, different groups that uh, what do you say change charge depending on the pH of the water. So, here we have these silica groups which are pretty common and they have these uh, silica which has hydroxyl groups which are pretty common on its exterior surface depending on the pH it can have a positive charge no charge or negative charge typically it will be in this range why is that if you look at it it is only predominant when pH is far less than 2 point of 0 charge is when pH is equal to 2 and when pH is greater than 2 and that is what 
most of our waters are right or that is where most of our waters are. So, it typically has a negative charge right. So, that is one reason for a negative charge. Adsorption due to humic acid or natural color on the silica surface or let us con be concerned with humic acid. We know that water has a lot of natural organic matter even 3, 4 milligram per liter of DOC that means there is a considerable amount of organic matter. In Yemna it is 12 or so, so it is 4, 5 times or 3, 4 times, so that is pretty high. So, this NOM will stay on the surface, not stay, suspended in the water, that is one aspect. But if there are particles, the NOM natural organic matter will be adsorbed onto the particles. So, most of these particles which we are concerned about will have natural organic matter or organic matter adsorbed onto the surface. And we saw these, uh, you know, one general structure for this natural organic matter, I think when we are discussing about disinfection in wastewater. We saw that, you know, there are different functional groups and such, which can release H plus and such. And most of them do release their H plus. So, that is why they have a negative charge and this humic acid or the natural or organic matter will lead to a negative charge on the surface. So, that is another thing to keep in mind. Another aspect is isomorphous replacement. For example, a metal in a metal oxide, metal oxide let us say is replaced by a metal with a lower valence. For example, instead of Si4 plus, if it is replaced by Al3 plus or Al3 plus is replaced by Fe2 plus right you will see that that metal oxide will have a negative charge right so isomorphous replacement will also need to a negative charge and structural imperfections well this is not as common as the other three causes you know bonds are broken on the edge of the crystal and you typically due to these imperfections you can have electrical charge or negative charge in general colloids have a net negative charge right and so they can't come together so the solution is stable so, by coagulation, I want to destabilize this, right? Okay, uh, I guess uh, to destabilize it, what do I do? I need to see to it that they come together. To be able to come together, what are the forces that are acting there and such? Let us look at it. So, we have what is called an electrical double layer, let us say, right? Uh, unlike what we just mentioned, a dispersion in solution does not have a net charge, right? Why is that? Because this colloids which have a net charge, negative charge will attract a positive charged layer around it, right? So, positive counter ions, right? Counter ions on the on and near the particle surface and the this layer is pretty, uh, what do we say, thin. It is only 0.5 nanometer thick and it is of cation meaning positively charged. It is they are bound to the particle due to electrostatic and adsorption forces, primarily electrostatic let us see, right. Need to charge on the colloid. So, that is why it is surrounded by these cations or positive charge. And also, even after this, you have a loose layer, relatively loose layer of positive and negative. I think we have a good picture later. We will come to that that forms beyond this uh, what we say stern layer the other above one is called stern layer and this layer can be up to 30 90, uh, nanometers thick and has a net negative charge and all this is called a double layer right so this is something we need to keep in mind so that's what we have here so we see the electrostatic uh, potential here in the first case here we see the colloid at the innermost region and then you can see the negative charge right negative charge here and then you can also see the positive charge in this region the positive charge which is which accumulate uh, around the colloid because of the electrostatic force of attraction right and that is called the stern layer this is the fixed layer or of fixed layer right or stern layer or fixed layer and around this you will have this diffuse layer right around this you will have this diffuse layer right this is what we have diffuse layer so again negative and positive counter ion and all that is uh, fine and here we have the bulk solution bulk solution meaning in general the water or such but this is the electrical double layer right from this particular okay let me draw it so all this is the electrical double layer right 
So, electrostatic potential as we go closer obviously it is uh, what do we say much higher and as we go uh, uh, far away it uh, decreases. So, that is one thing to uh, understand or keep in mind and here we see something called a zeta potential we will look at that but note that it is the one that is in the that is relevant to the diffuse layer let us say right. So, zeta potential let us see. Let us move on. So, here if a similar particle wants to come nearby right this net negative field and such will not let them come together. Obviously, as you see you have this electrostatic uh, force of repulsion, but we will come back to that. So, how do I what do we say see to it that the particles can come together before we look at that we need to understand some other aspects. So, zeta potential just a side aspect the electrical potential between the shear plane and the bulk solution right. So, this you can measure from here as in if I apply a potential negative and positive the colloids which are negatively charged will move out here and will they will drag a cloud of uh, particles which let us say typically positive will be towards or aligned towards the negative charge. Again from this I can measure the uh, zeta potential which we also looked at here let us see right. So, let me move on. So, particle stability. So, particles in the waters are stable right because there is a balance there. Why is that? Uh, we have two forces one is the electrostatic force that ripple that ripples or electrostatic force of repulsion and the attractive force which is the van der Waal force of attraction let us see. This we cannot do much about it and this is obviously something we need, want in this context, but we can you know do something about this electrostatic force of repulsion. Again the particles with the negative charge the mechanism controlling stability as I just mentioned is the electrostatic repulsion and let us just understand this. So, if this is it repulsion will increase with uh, ok, ok. If this is repulsion electrostatic force of repulsion this is it. So, and this is the distance as the distance decreases you know this repulsion force will increase let us see right. Let me try to draw it with a better color. So, as I am coming nearer to my particle of interest this is increasing right. But what about this van der Waals force of attraction that we uh, talked about how is that going to help me now. So, even that will be depend upon the uh, distance, but even more uh, what do we say slowly. So, it will come into the picture only when they are close by and more importantly it will have a remarkable effect something like this ok. So, the net will be a repulsion force when it is near not near let me use this color. So, the net this is repulsion this is attraction this is due to electrostatic force this is due to van der Waal. What will the net look like? The net will be like that it is in general repulsion here attraction there repulsion in general this and then a steep come down. So, in the area above this green line it is repulsion. So, when it is relatively far away or just about to come to the surface or near the surface of my particle here it is repulsion and only later when they are very close will the attraction take over. But because there is repulsion when they are far away or just nearby they cannot come together. How do I make them come together? I can see to it that this electrostatic repulsion is decreased right. Let me look at that. We will just look at this curve and end this session for today. So, here is surface of particle A and surface of particle B right. So, I have two cases repulsion curve number 1 and net energy curve number 1 when no coagulant is present. So, what do I have here particle is 0 here 0. So, as I bring one towards the other repulsion force is this repulsion force is this and where is my van der Waals force of attraction this is my van der Waals force of attraction which increases greatly if I am very near. If I am very near you see that it is remarkably high right, but the net the net is somewhere here and as you see this barrier my particle cannot uh, cross as it comes nearby this repulsion will push it away. So, if I want to see to it that this repulsion is decreased from there to here or if I can do that then I see this net will be like this right 
as it uh, comes nearer you will have a net what do we say attractive uh, what do we say uh, curve or such if I may say so net attractive force. So, how do I do that I can neutralize the charge on this particular collide. So, that was what was causing this electrostatic uh, what do we say repulsion. So, by adding a charge which is opposite to the charge on the collide I can cut down on this electrostatic force of repulsion. Then as the particles come together the van der Waal force of attraction takes over and the particles can coalesce. So, this is or this process is called coagulation. I am trying to destabilize the relevant uh, system or the colloids by adding a coagulant here right and I am trying to you know trigger that initial coalescence of the particles. So, with that I will end today's uh, session and we will continue this in the next session. This in sense we will look at coagulation and then obviously flocculation right. As usual thanking you for your patience I will end today's session.